Hello and welcome. My name is Shannon Kemp and I'm the Chief Digital Manager of Dataversity. We'd like to thank you for joining the current installment of the monthly Dataversity Smart Data webinar series with Adrian Bowles. Today, Adrian will discuss artificial intelligence at the edge. Just a couple of points to get us started. Due to the large number of people that attend these sessions, you will be muted during the webinar. For questions, we'll be collecting them via the Q&A in the bottom right-hand corner of your screen, or if you like to tweet, we encourage you to share highlights of questions via Twitter using hashtag SmartData. If you'd like to chat with us and with each other, we certainly encourage you to do so. Just click the chat icon in the top right-hand corner for that feature. And as always, we will send a follow-up email within two business days containing links to the slides, the recording of the session, and additional information requested throughout the webinar. Now let me introduce to you our speaker for today, Adrian Bowles. Adrian is an industry analyst, analyst, and recovering academic, providing research and advisory services for buyers, sellers, and investors in emerging technology markets. His coverage areas include cognitive computing, big data analytics, the Internet of Things, and cloud computing. Adrian co-authored Cognitive Computing and Big Data Analytics, published by Wiley in 2015, and is currently writing a book on the business and societal impacts of these emerging technologies. Adrian and earned his BA in Psychology and MS in Computer Science from SUNY Binghamton and his PhD in Computer Science from Northwestern University. And with that, I will give the floor to Adrian to get today's webinar started. Hello and welcome. Hi, Shannon. Thank you. Thank you. And welcome to everybody uh, who's online with us wherever you are. Yeah, so today's topic, AI at the Edge, um, subtitled Intelligence in the Fog. We're to talk about uh, distributed intelligence, working with fog and edge computing, and uh, in particular, look at the business impact. So I'll tell you now, there'll be a bonus point at some point for recognizing the, uh, the scene in the picture that I took on a foggy day a couple of years ago. But right now, let's just dive right into it. So I'm going to begin with uh, some context for the remarks today and some definitions because a lot of these things are a little on the fuzzy side, especially when you're talking fog computing. Talk uh, on the technical side uh, about some architectural issues, uh, things that you have to decide when you're distributing intelligence, and then uh, a little bit about the business implications and some thoughts on how to get started creating business value, building applications with distributed intelligence. And I'll give a couple of recommendations. So let's dive right into it. Okay. Uh, the focus today really is to bring together a few technology areas and show how uh, by leveraging uh, pieces of each, we can create something of value for businesses. And so the three are the Internet of Things, or IoT, cognitive computing, and cloud computing, and a derivative of cloud computing that I'll explain uh, in a little more detail. So let's start with the Internet of Things. The IoT starts with sensors and uh, ends with actions. Sometimes you think about it as going from uh, sensors to insights, but really if we're not doing anything with it, uh, it's not much use. So I want to focus on how we can use uh, sensor-based systems at the edge of our network to help us take some action. And a lot of times the action is uh, making a business decision or making a technical decision. But let's look at the technology to begin with and then how we put it all together and then we can um, have a discussion about what um, what are the business implications of building a system uh, using this technology, using this approach, using these architectures, rather than more conventional systems uh, of the past. So just in terms of uh, terminology, a sensor, we're going to say uh, simply is a device that detects the presence or senses something. Uh, so there's a signal. The sensor gets the signal in and either reports or signals something about that event. So it's an event-driven device. And a sensor can either be stationary or mobile. By stationary, I think I mean uh, something that's static, uh, that doesn't move relative to the rest of the world. It may move within a, um, a small area, but in general, 
uh, these are the, the two main categories. So if I look at a jet engine here, this uh, happens to be an SR-71 Blackbird, but the more modern jet engines uh, today typically have about 5,000 sensors uh, per jet engine. And those sensors collectively are generating about 10 gigabytes per second per engine. So if you think about it that way, the sensors that are on an engine are static with regard to the engine. They're not moving around the engine. They're attached to the engine. But assuming that the engine is on a plane that's flying, uh, we can think of those sensors as being mobile. And that's an important distinction because the the environment the sensors are working in uh, is, uh, is something that can also be uh, static or mobile. And so if we have a static sensor on a mobile device or on a mobile, um, in a mobile environment, then we can think of it uh, in both ways, depending on what we're trying to get it to do. So when we look at the IoT um, in aggregate, it's a collection of applications and appliances or devices. The key thing is that each of the devices is connected to the internet. And so you can think of it as the internet of, um, of things or the internet of everything. Uh, one of my colleagues, Ken Delaney, is starting to talk about IoT as integration of things, which I think is a good way of looking at it. Uh, what we're trying to do here uh, is specifically today is look at how we can take devices that are attached to the internet, that are distributed in that way, and make them smarter. So we're not just looking at uh, getting more data or getting it faster. We want to have a little more intelligence. And that brings us to the next point. Um, sorry, uh, just to finish up in terms of the mobile versus static, because I, I think it's important uh, to have this classification in the back of our minds as we look at the different applications. Vehicles, individuals, people, um, the militaries, we have a lot of examples from the military, whether you're dealing with an individual, a troop, a, a soldier, or a device uh, that has sensors within it that don't move relative to the device, so within the tank but the tank moves, and so we have to have a connection between that and another system. And so those we would think of as a mobile connector. Uh, Sensor-based devices, IoT types of devices in uh, relatively stable environments or static environments would include things like um, sensors on a machine, on an assembly line, in what we think of as a smart factory. Uh, retail store, we may have sensors that are detecting um, something as simple as uh, how many people are coming in and going. It may get a little more sophisticated and have uh, sensors that are looking at uh, attributes of the people that are coming and going, like doing some facial recognition perhaps, or doing some uh, something that looks at their height, weight, um, other uh, attributes. But the sensor itself is static. The people move past it and then that data gets collected. Um, smart cities is another area. Um, I covered this once in a, another webinar, uh, looking at smart cities in detail. But basically, we'll have sensors in uh, most modern cities today for things like transportation, uh, services, uh, emergency services, lighting control, traffic control. Almost any sort of device uh, that's out there that's owned by a municipality is something that can probably be instrumented. In Chicago, for example, the streetlights, uh, there's a set of uh, what they call smart streetlights that are connected to the IoT that are also, besides um, providing light, those are uh, points for data collection on air quality. Uh, so this would be static. Uh, although they may be checking um, the condition, looking for events of things going past them, we can think of a lot of different intelligent or um, different ways that we might observe important events using these types of sensors as the event um, basically moves past the sensor. 
what I want to do is kind of look at this in in the context of um, what I normally cover in this series, which is uh, artificial intelligence and cognitive computing. So now let's look at um, what we're going to use for simple definitions there today. This is a pretty busy diagram, but I'm going to try and focus on just one part of it. If we think about the center, um, the second ring here in the circle that has understand, reason, and learn, those are the three defining characteristics of what we think of as cognitive computing. And the important part here is that on the left side, we're looking at input. Uh, right side is output. The top is uh, interaction with humans, and the bottom is with machines. So if you look at the lower left, we've got machine input, and that's where we're getting data from uh, sensors or from the IoT. So we'll just kind of narrow the focus a little and look at that bottom. So what we want to do today is look at how do we take this type of functionality and the most important part of this from my perspective, you'll probably figure out why later, is the idea of reasoning and put that uh, in the field in a device that is doing the sensing so that we're distributing uh, logical reasoning, not just distributing data processing. Now, the next part in the um, set of definitions here, I said we're going to look at IoT, cognitive, and cloud, and the derivatives. So fog, uh, it's meant to be funny, but uh, it's actually the truth here in terms of what is fog computing. It's a cloud that can't get off the ground. So we're looking at something that we're not sending uh, data or processing or signals uh, up to some amorphous space in the air. We're dealing with something on the ground, um, metaphorically, because you can be dealing with fog for, uh, for planes that are in the air too, but where it's actually at the very end point. You can't get any more uh, concrete, if you will, rather than abstract. Think of the cloud as being up uh, ethereal and abstract. Fog is on the ground. This is where we have the endpoint. So, fog computing is looking at devices that are at the end or the edge of the network. And it's often used interchangeably. This next uh, example and set of definitions for edge, which is uh, fairly synonymous, I put this one in for Shannon. So, when we're dealing with the distinction between the fog and the edge, obviously the edge is the lead guitars for U2. But more importantly, anything outside the data center is generally thought of as the edge if we're dealing with network uh, computing or telecom. In general usage, it's the edge if it's a node on the network that's terminal. It doesn't go any further. So it's the furthest from the data center or the furthest from the cloud. And so in practical terms, we're going to use fog and edge uh, pretty much interchangeably. Edge is specifically at the very edge. It's the last thing. There's nothing um, beyond that on the network. In the fog, we may have multiple uh, nodes, uh, each of which are edge nodes, that are aggregated. And that's what we're going to see in terms of the architecture. One other area that we need to uh, bring in when we're looking at uh, distributing all of this is the idea of autonomy, because right now, uh, when we look at um, artificial intelligence, one of the hot areas is autonomous systems, whether we're dealing with uh, the Navy's ship that can uh, sail oceans autonomously or a self-driving car. And so I just want to uh, make the distinction between autonomy and intelligence, because we do see them interact. You can be autonomous without being intelligent. You can be intelligent without being autonomous. Autonomy is specifically the ability to make independent decisions and actions, whereas intelligence uh, fits with our definition of cognitive. Intelligence means that you have to be able to uh, learn. You have to be able to understand. And we don't really have time in, uh, in this webinar to get into a deep coverage of things like knowledge representation, how do we know that something is understood? 
But combining those three, understanding, reasoning, and learning. In general, we also think that uh, characteristics for intelligence um, are the ability to abstract, which fits with uh, logical reasoning, and to generalize, which again, uh, we can use uh, logic, whether we're dealing with um, inductive, deductive, or abductive reasoning. All of those fit together in the general idea of intelligence. What we want to look at today is moving the intelligence part of this to the edge of the network, whether or not the actual node, the device that has one or more sensors, um, is autonomous. We want to give it the information and the power to be autonomous, even if it's not used in that way. So when we're looking at um, autonomy and um, automation, uh, going from giving advice to giving the authority to act on the device, uh, I use this example because we've got a, um, a Grand Prix car that has lots and lots of sensors. And as a general rule, when the car is um, running properly and is um, under the control of the driver, those sensors are providing data and information to the driver who's going to adjust accordingly. They're also providing in real time uh, data to the, uh, the car's crew which is in relatively close proximity. Uh, and that's happening in real time or near real time. They're also aggregating and collecting data that will be used at the completion of the race, right? So you can think of the sensors that are on the car as being uh, static with regard to the car, but mobile with regard to the environment. And the, the functions of these sensors uh, how it's how the things are being reported and who has control based on uh, the events can change quite rapidly. So, in this case, it was a horrific crash. Fortunately, the driver did walk away from it. It's pretty amazing with a 46 G impact. But if we look at it and say, okay, do we want the car to detect through this? that the driver is no longer in control. We have sensors that can tell um, that the driver is unconscious, for one thing, and although it's very dramatic in this case, uh, think about it, we could also have the same kind of sensors in our uh, personal transportation cars if we still have cars before we get to uh, fully autonomous vehicles. Do you take control away from the driver when you recognize that the driver has basically abdicated control by being unconscious. So I have to start to look at where decisions are made based on um, a number of factors and different uh, values for the data that we get. And so the question that all of this is leading up to is, if we have systems where um, at a remote point at the edge of the network, if you will, we're getting data, we're getting um, uh, a report of events, do we need to take that information, that data, that signal, if we go back to one of the earlier diagrams, and send it somewhere else, perhaps to the cloud, perhaps to a data center, we send it somewhere else and have the actual decisions made somewhere else? Are we just collecting data or are we going to operate on that data um, at the point where the the data is collected. And you can probably tell from the title of the talk and from where I'm going with this, that the general rule is going to be you push the control, you push the ability to make the decisions to the point where it's going to have the most utility or where it can first be done. And we can think of this in sort of the old military model where data would come from uh, lower level individuals uh, on at the front, it gets passed up and higher level folks uh, further back or further up in the, um, the chain of command or higher up on a, an org chart in an organization, make a decision, the decision goes down, uh, gets passed back down 
and then the actual action is uh, taken out again uh, in graph theory terms at the leaf nodes, at the edge of the network. Well, what we're trying to do here is look at what are the characteristics that allow us to uh, act at the edge without having to pass that control back and forth. And that's what we're looking at today. So the question becomes, uh, this is something that's been you know, debated in different um, applications. You'll get different answers for this. So there'll be different architectures. But the question is, do we move the computation to where the data is collected, or, or do we collect the data and send it to um, a compute engine? If it's a, an optimization question, uh, really, and a question of bandwidth and expediency and cost. So in this, uh, this slide, what I'm getting at here is if you have a data center and you have uh, sensor-based devices that are providing data and uh, updates on events to the data center, at what point, what are the characteristics of a problem that you would solve where you would not have to go to the data center for an answer, but you would just be reporting uh, the events and what you did about them to the data center. And the gateway here represents uh, a device that aggregates information from multiple devices, uh, each of which has one or more sensors. So we're gonna look at that part in just a little more detail. But first, let's kind of um, dive into this problem of partitioning the problem and uh, distributing data processing and ultimately intelligence. If you built um, application software uh, years ago, uh, one of the early questions, one of the early battles among people that were trying to uh, formalize or improve the process of software development was, do we start by modeling the processes? Is it data processing or, well, it is data processing, but is it uh, the process that we want to model first and then get the data to the process? Or is it the data that we want to model, which is more stable, which is more um, uh, subject to change? Do we start by building an entity relationship diagram of the data and then figure out how the process fit with it? Or do we do a process model and then tie that? Then, of course, we got through the, uh, the object wars and we had uh, objects that have processing and data associated with them. And now we want to look a step further into how do we distribute processes, data, and what we're calling intelligence. And that's the subject of the next few slides. And pardon me if I lose my voice here. I'm still getting over a cold. So we have to decide what we're going to move or distribute and when we're going to do it. And the next few uh, diagrams the rectangles uh, represent data or data source. The uh, circles, uh, just labeled with um, P for processing, represent a processing element. And the more complex circle, if you will, represents an intelligent element. And the reason I'm making this distinction is a processing element could be something as complex as a supercomputer. It could be something as simple as um, a Raspberry Pi, it could be even more simple than that. It could be uh, basically a, an atomic element, if you will, that just forms one operation on one piece of data. So what we need to do is look at the attributes of the process that we need to uh, perform and the types of data that we're going to work with. Again, remember, uh, this is all in the context of uh, data is collected by sensors, so it's event driven. So one thing to do on the left here, we've got a number of different data sources that are sharing a processor. So in this uh, uh, representation, I'm saying we're gonna take a processor and we're gonna bring the data to the processor, perform some calculations, some computation, make some decision, if you will, and then perhaps update those uh, data sources or perhaps the output from that processor one is going to go to another processor. It could be a completely different system. Architecturally, an alternative is 
each data source is going to have a um, have its own processor. We could also have it so that the uh, the data sources, uh, sorry, the the processors move logically or physically to the data. And when we start to get into uh, different data architectures, so that's kind of what's being done in some architectures for things like uh, in-memory databases, where uh, the movement of the data is such that it's um, more efficient to move the processing closer to the data than it is to deal with the bandwidth and uh, throughput issues of moving the data itself. So the two extremes, if you will, is what I'm trying to get at here. Do we put the data inside the processor, meaning that the processor is going to be relatively static, or do we uh, have the data uh, try not to move the data, but move the processing element towards it? And the general approach that I'm advocating here going forward is that in the middle, we're going to have something that includes a processing element and uh, not just data, but uh, reasoning, uh, which would include uh, processing with sort of goal-directed processing, I guess would be one way to think of this. So the intelligence is that not only are we performing some uh, set of operations on data, but we're doing it uh, with knowledge about that data that could be adaptive. And that's the whole uh, sort of central thesis, if you will, behind what we're doing with cognitive computing. So we're not just taking a, um, let's say, a, a deterministic approach that if, uh, or a rule-based approach where there's, uh, based on what the input is in the current state, there's only one possibility for the next state. That would be a deterministic approach. Uh, if there are multiple possibilities, we're dealing with something that's uh, evidence-based and, and we're dealing with probabilities, then you have to have that reasoning. You either have to send the data to a reasoning engine or, uh, again, what we're, we're uh, promoting here in terms of the, the architectural idea is have a small reasoning engine and the knowledge to actually interpret and process uh, intelligently at the device uh, and learn from that and then just report back. So you're not asking uh, necessarily at, for each um, each event, you're not passing that data and um, conditioned back to the cloud or to uh, a data center, you're processing it at the edge, uh, which would go along with their definition of, of actually processing intelligently in the fog. And to do that uh, with any degree of efficiency, we need to have um, a three-tier, at least, architecture. Let me explain what we mean by that. Two tier would be that if every device um, was at the sensor level, so there's a one to one correspondence between sensor and device, if those are going to have to correspond or uh, yeah, correspond as in communicate with your compute engine, so they're, they're just gathering and reporting, the compute engine could be a data center, it could be a, a, um, something in the cloud. Obviously, that doesn't make any sense, sorry, make any difference, it does make sense. The data center, the cloud, a cluster network, whatever it is, that's where the computation is uh, happening. But the idea is that you get a huge amount of um, overhead if every little device uh, just takes a small piece of information and has to communicate. So every time there's uh, an update, you have a bandwidth issue. What you would like to do, it's a general engineering principle anyway, you would like to be able to process things at the lowest level where you have the, um, the full context to make a, the right decision. And so the three tier basically introduces a, um, a device between uh, individual sensors and your compute engine that aggregates, it'll do some processing, it'll do the aggregation and packaging, 
And so you can have any number arbitrarily of sensors or devices uh, with sensors that are then um, working with the gateway. The gateway is typically a, a smaller hardware device that uh, could be something as small, even as uh, even smaller than your Raspberry Pi. You've got a gateway in your uh, smartphone, for example. You've got a number of sensors in a smartphone, and each of those is not um, communicating directly with the outside world. There's a gateway, there's some processing uh, internally. And then the aggregated uh, result is communicated, uh, communicates uh, through the gateway to the system. And for the case of a, a cell phone, you can think of the um, that as being yet another tier because uh, the, the cell phone signal is going to a tower, the tower is doing the handoff and all that, uh, and the actual back-end processing is at yet another location. So you've got a kind of a fourth tier there. But the basic idea is that whenever you have a lot of these um, sensors, you need to add in this step, this, um, this piece of hardware, so that um, you can have more power at the edge, if you will. The gateway is uh, uh, still thought of as at the edge. Um, in terms of it's outside the network, it's outside the uh, the major processing area, but the gateway um, is controlling or coordinating, uh, collecting the data from each of the actual sensors. And now what I'm uh, suggesting here is that at this point, what we want to be doing is having smarter gateways so that we can add reasoning and um, some level of understanding there rather than having that data have to come back. So one, um, one place that this is already being done, uh, there's been some advances in the last couple of years. One of the issues when you get into uh, some big models with uh, deep learning is that you need a lot of training data and it's impractical to do the training at the edge. Uh, you need a, a lot of computational power. But if you can have a system that will do the training and then take a trained model, if you will, so it's a, a much smaller amount of data and knowledge that goes into your model at the edge, then we can do the training um, in the cloud or at the cluster, compress it, uh, compress the model, and run that deep learning model uh, on a much smaller piece of hardware. And that's, um, that's sort of uh, a general trend that we're seeing now. There's been some advances in, as I said, in the last couple of years, if anybody's interested in those, uh, we can follow up um, offline. When I was talking about the idea of uh, mobile or uh, mobile and autonomous, which again, uh, tend to go together, but they don't have to, you can be uh, mobile but have no autonomy at all. Everything is directed from above or, or pre-programmed. But when we're dealing with autonomous uh, systems that have to collaborate, that's when it gets uh, even more interesting, I think, because if we start to have uh, multiple systems, let's say uh, you have one uh, autonomous vehicle uh, that, that has to deal with the um, human controlled vehicles, but if you have multiple um, autonomous vehicles, they have to communicate and collaborate with each other. And so each one of them uh, could be thought of as an edge device. Within each one, you're going to have multiple sensors and those are gonna be aggregated. So you may have multiple levels of these gateways. Uh, if you think about the systems that are in your automobile today, uh, even if it's uh, not automated at all, I mean, frankly, any car, I believe it's 1996 and later in the U.S., um, has to have a, a system, if it's sold in the U.S., has to have an OBD, an onboard diagnostic system, and that's collecting data from a variety of sensors. Some of those are mandated by law so that you can uh, go into uh, your local emissions test uh, run by the government and they can check uh, data that has been collected. But in addition to what's being collected for things like commission tests, 
there are a number of sensors, everything from each of your uh, tires will today have to have a uh, TPMS, a tire pressure monitoring uh, system. That's a sensor. Each of those gets um, aggregated. Each of the, the, the sensor data from each tire gets aggregated um, by the TPMS. That also gets aggregated at the computer level. And for some of these things, you are expected uh, as the driver to um, to respond to changes. In some cases, signals are being sent to uh, the automobile manufacturer. If you're uh, um, things like uh, wear sensors, so um, if if the instances, if you will, which would be an individual car, if they have to communicate with each other for things like navigation, then we have to have this uh, intermediate loop. If they don't, if it's one car, let's say the car is still technically under the control of a driver, then you may be collecting things at the edge. Uh, certainly today, there are a number of cars that will uh, take control from a driver. Uh, if they detect certain events, uh, cars that uh, do automatic braking uh, based on sensors that can use anything from radar to LIDAR to, to other technologies. Uh, so it's, it's a question there of how much intelligence goes at the edge so that that system can take control, if you will, uh, based on this knowledge and learning. Just a, a couple of quick things here um, in terms of uh, attributes that we want to consider when we're deciding what gets uh, pushed to the edge and what gets kept um, inside, if you will, the, the cloud or the, the data center. If we have something that's high complexity on data, like uh, CCTV would be close to TV video images, and you want to be doing something like monitoring, looking for um, people in a database, if you're monitoring at an airport, for example, the device itself is static, it's high complexity, that's a different kind of problem than if you're dealing with something that's mobile, uh, you've got a Fitbit, uh, the mobile part of it adds, adds um, difficulty to the processing, but the fact that the data itself is uh, low in complexity makes up for it. So low complexity mobile is easier to allocate to the edge than um, the actual reasoning on a high complexity data uh, source that's um, that's static. Just one one set of um, issues to look at. Another one is the complexity of the data in terms of uh, structure. And I don't like the the term unstructured. What I'm getting at here is if something is deep or dense versus uh, shallow, then it's um, the case that it's more difficult to put that level of intelligence at the edge. It's easier, uh, regardless of how fast the data is coming in, whether it's uh, you know, in batch, something that's static, or whether it's a high, high volume, uh, high frequency trading app, if the data itself is easily interpreted, then we can probably uh, keep that um, that intelligence at the edge. Now I'm going to turn to the business end of things and look at the kinds of uh, impact that we have uh, as we get more and more data that's coming in from the IoT. So my, my comment here that it's a complex data rich world and sensors are everywhere should be fairly obvious, but I'm going to try and give some examples of things that uh, you might not see in your daily life. But uh, streaming kind of data like market data, um, news data, things that are coming off traffic um, signals, traffic cams, the easy pass system, that sort of thing. Uh, those are all fairly straight, straightforward if we're dealing with uh, traffic or um, easy pass that uh, it's called different things in different parts of the country where you have a transponder that is communicating with a, a so your mobile device 
in your car is communicating with a static device as you pass by it. But the actual data itself is very simple. What I want to start to look at here is things where there are devices all over the place, like on this uh, picture here, the Seaport Hotel in Boston, where you can actually go online and see how many open slots there are on the bike rack. And that might sound trivial, but hopefully in the next 10 minutes, we'll see why that could be the start of a completely new business for you. So once we start to recognize that there are all these things out there, each individual is producing a lot of data in general. Uh, if you're carrying a smartphone, have other devices, you've got your computer, you're also generating data um, just by your mere presence as static and some mobile um, sensor-based devices are noting your presence, how are we going to turn that into a business opportunity? So when everything is connected, and we're going to combine the IoT and uh, this cognitive computing, just the IoT means that we've got new sources of data, and we've got new sources of value from existing data. We have to start challenging these assumptions. In terms of the uh, putting them together, we've got some new technologies that are out there, new models, and we're building new ecosystems. That's actually a pretty cool time. So I'm going to give uh, five or six, I think, here examples of how to leverage um, the, this type of data and how to distribute intelligence to do it more effectively. So we're going to look at uh, the five rules here, know your customers, know what they want, know when they, uh, their wants change, know where your customers are and where they'll be, and then the last one is anticipate opportunities. For each of those, the uh, general advice is we've got to be looking at it and say, okay, um, do we have data that's related to this? Can we detect things that are going to change our relationship with our customer? Or uh, do we have data about our own products, our own services that are going to change based on detecting a person, um, their presence or some behavior? So let's uh, take a quick look. We and start with know your customers. So the idea here is when we're getting into know your customers, and I put that little intelligence um, bubble in the middle. Uh, we can use technologies ranging from natural language processing, analytics, and machine learning. Right now, I just want to say, okay, whatever we're using here, uh, the important characteristic is that I want it to be able to uh, reason based on the context and make a decision at the edge. So we've got uh, information about our customer that we have either gathered from combination sources that can be our previous interactions with them, our history, uh, they have given us profiles in the past where it could be uh, collecting them. But basically, uh, it's looking at the, um, the sensor-based systems uh, where it can be active, it can be passive, it can be something uh, where they have to be wearing a Fitbit when they come in your store and you're going to know something about them, or uh, the sensor itself can be passive. It's just, it's not doing anything until the person walks past. But what we want to be able to do here is to start building systems that understand um, the customer so that when certain events transpire, we can react to them, but we can also go further than that, which is if we know what they want and we know that uh, sort of what's causing them to want something, when those things change and we'll know about it because of the sensors, we can react in uh, real time or right time, if you will. Uh, it doesn't necessarily have to be uh, what we think of as uh, formally real time, but we can uh, provide the right offer or the right response or the right um, signal where we're responding to an event that the customer may not even be aware of. So know what they want. We're going to get that, again, using the same kind of um, sensors, based on tracking their behavioral history. And if you think about it, uh, 
hopefully we're looking at this uh, in an opt-in kind of fashion, um, people are trading that uh, privacy for the pursuit, if you will, of better engagement with their um, providers or with uh, companies in general. So if you allow uh, exchange between your sensor-based devices and retailers, uh, just as one example, then the, uh, what's being tracked, and for it's current, that means it's the current history, it's tracking you as you're doing something, then we can provide a more tailored solution. Uh, but only, in general, only if we can uh, act at or near the time uh, that an event has occurred. So we may have to be doing that um, at the edge rather than passing it back. It may have to be something that is generated within a store, within a mall, uh, within your car, if you will, um, rather than we'll gather all this information and then tonight we'll decide that we should have offered you, you know, a special deal. Um, offering you a special on an oil change may be more appealing uh, if you happen to be within five miles of the dealer and you're getting closer to it rather than you're driving away from it and the system has collected information and knows or can calculate that you're probably on your way to work and by offering you this deal uh, and including um, an Uber to your office, you're going to get better response uh, as the retailer. So all of this uh, can be enhanced, if you will, by being able to do it at the edge and collecting this data and acting on it with that intelligence about the customer. But here's where I think it gets uh, more interesting. When the wants change, and we're gonna understand that by having sensors that are looking at the history and the environmental factors. So uh, if we are now uh, have a, a smarter system, and not only do I know where you are and where you're going, Maybe I know because you put a root in Waze, your uh, collaborative sensor-based um, GPS system, but I can also tell um, based on your history and the real-time weather, which I may be getting updates from the weather service, but I could also be getting it from the barometer on all my subscribers' phones, then a change in the environmental factor will change your wants and needs and I can provide that offer to you, but again, only if I can get it to you in a reasonable time, which may preclude me from sending that information back to a data center. So it's one more case of pushing the intelligence um, out to the edge in order to have a better engagement. Know where your customers are and where they're going. This is a, really an extension, sorry, of, um, of the earlier examples, but here we can also figure out using the technologies, um, mobile Wi-Fi beacons, all those are all um, sensor-based. Um, using technology like facial recognition now um, that we already have in uh, multiple phones, we can build that into sensors in the car, some interesting work being done right there. Um, so by combining edge-based collection and processing, uh, all of these things can start to work together and collaborate without going through a central site. And then anticipate opportunities. This is where uh, the more data we have and the communication between devices that doesn't necessarily need to go through um, a central site we can have my agent talk to your agent, if you will. And all of that can still be done um, based on the logic and the reasoning engines in each individual's device um, at the gateway level. It's not gonna be done at the sensor level because in general, you need data from more than one sensor to make a decision. And the last one here, um, my suggestion that uh, if you're building applications, you need to have the application be what I call aware everywhere. And the idea of that is that 
your application needs to be constantly getting data from wherever the best source is and making it available for action uh, using the, I'd like to say, inherent intelligence. But there's nothing inherent about it. You've got to put it in there. Uh, and so it's, it's combining these technologies to make applications more effective by leveraging uh, the mobile aspect. And, and in this um, example, I'm talking about um, mobile sensors providing that um, analysis, if you will, uh, at the point where the data is collected rather than aggregating it. And so to start thinking about that, i try and uh, wrap it up in a minute here to leave time for questions. Start thinking about your customers, whatever business you're in, and think about what data they're already producing. And I'm going to start with uh, the typical cell phone. This is a, a list of sensors from um, an iPhone. You've got an accelerometer, you've got an uh, ambient light sensor, you've got a barometer, a geolocator, etc. The idea is that each of these is providing data to the gateway in your phone. Um, there are actions that the phone is taking um, that don't require it to interact with a data center or the tower, et cetera. So, you know, proximity sensor is the one that if you pick up your phone, you've dialed it and you pick it up and you put it to the side of your head, it knows that at that point it can turn the screen off. Um, I'm not sure what else I would use that for, but uh, we'll start with the barometer. The barometer is used inside, the barometer in your phone is used to calculate things like um, your altitude, so change in barometer, uh, can be used to, uh, with um, the accelerometer uh, combined to start to build fitness apps. So it knows how many steps you've gone, but also how, how many um, flights of stairs, how many times have, have you gone up or down based on the barometric pressure. But now if you start to aggregate barometric uh, data from a pool of people, and use that and their geolocator, you can say, all right, I'm going to look at changes in barometric pressure uh, among this pool of 1,000 people that are all within three city blocks. Now we can start to get um, weather data based on that. And you can, with a, um, a system that can alert if we know characteristics of the, the geography, it may be that we can start to um, do specially priced offers. We can know that the barometric pressure is changing and based on historical data, we know that that's gonna change buying behavior. Uh, one that's been well researched is uh, as, as um, humidity goes up, hair care product sales go up. So if I look at this and I have a, a profile of the individual and I have the sensor-based data, then I may be able to offer um, a something that's um, tailored to an individual that's going to need conditioner in the next 20 minutes when the, uh, the humidity uh, changes dramatically. And I'll get that information not from the weather service. I could get general information from the weather service, but I'll get it from looking at the behavioral patterns from all the opt-in users or all the anonymized users to see that they're changing um, where they're going and that the, uh, the weather has changed based on, that I'm deducing this, uh, based on their, um, their own sensors which have been, again, aggregated through those um, gateways. All right. So the other thing you want to do, and this goes back to that, uh, that's the same diagram from before, is start to look for new uses for existing data sources. You're going to look for new data sources too, but there's no shortage of data. The idea is you want to look at what's out there at the edge that's creating data collect it with a, an IoT-enabled um, system, if you will, that can use that data to present offers near where the data is being created. 
and just the, the two diagrams here. Um, I first captured this one at uh, the Seaport Hotel when I was staying there a couple of years ago and realized that you could start um, combining data from things like bike racks with traffic data that uh, most cities will provide um, a reasonable stream of data, uh, provided with weather data, provided with things like uh, bike availability. If you were a, um, an Uber driver, you might want to start to look at um, outsmarting your, your competition, the other drivers, by understanding what's happening in your neighborhood at a greater level of detail uh, based on all this sensor-based data. The diagram on the right happens to be my, um, my hometown here in Connecticut, uh, that you can start to capture everything from weather to traffic to behavior data. Uh, it's, it's out there. So the quick recommendations, you want to process and analyze and put the intelligence as close to the source as possible, move everything to the edge. If you get to a state where you've got a lot of processing uh, today, rather than pass that back and forth, you can cut down on the, the overhead and the bandwidth and the time by exploiting um, more advanced hardware, things like GPUs, uh, at the edge. And my kind of the, the insight here is, uh, as you're thinking about building these applications, don't think about, um, you don't need to own all the data. You need to own the idea that will give you the insights from the data. It's all coming from the outside world. And so I'm going to wrap with this one. There are new opportunities to put intelligence at the edge and benefit from publicly available data. Uh, this screen is from a website called Thingful that is uh, trying to build the world's largest repository of um, publicly available um, IoT data. And with that, um, let's see if we have any questions. And I would encourage folks to uh, to keep in touch. I've got my email on there. And there's a plug Shannon mentioned that I'm working on a new book. And we'll have more information on that next month. But it's uh, really looking at how all this comes together in what I call the age of reasoning as machines uh, at the edge start to have that capability. So Shannon, back to you. Adrian, thank you so much for another fantastic presentation. And I think the U2 song, I still have, I can't find what I'm looking for, has a whole new meaning. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> um, so if you have any questions, feel free to submit them in the Q&A just to answer the most commonly asked questions. I will be sending a follow-up email for this webinar by end of day Monday. <laughs> Thanks to the slides, the recording, and uh, anything else there. And as Adrian has up there, next month we're going to be talking about a pragmatic AI maturity model. Very exciting. Uh, everyone's pretty quiet today. It's the new year. So it's kind of been everyone's been kind of quiet in the new year. There's lots of stuff going on, I'm sure. Mm. But uh, okay. yeah, yeah. If anybody's got any questions, feel free to submit them to Adrian. He's got a couple options there. And again, I'll get that follow-up email by end of day Monday. Adrian, thank you so much. I hope you feel better. Thanks. And thanks, Happy Jenny. New Year, everyone. And thanks to all of our attendees for being engaged. Thanks. Take care. Enjoy. Bye.